Thank you, Mr. Robert, for your talk. And now we continue with, the, with another talk delivered by keynote speaker Matthew Trenish, open source developer advocate, IBM. The talk is titled Open Source Quantum Computing. Hi. Um, thank you for that introduction. I'm very excited to be here. It's my first time in Oman, and I've been having a great time so far. Um, so I'm here today to uh, talk about quantum computing and the role that open source software is playing in this developing field. Um, but before we can get started, we really need to talk about what quantum computers are. You hear a lot of things if you read the tech press, or if you're a little nerdy like me, you watch science fiction anime, and they have quantum computers in it. This was a television program I watched in college, and this was the fictional quantum computer from that show. Um, but this isn't actually what a quantum computer looks like. Um, these are some photos of IBM's quantum computer um, in the uh, New York Research Lab that I work out of. Um, the most of this space is actually about cooling. This is called a dilution refrigerator, and it cools the little quantum chip, which is what that guy is holding in the bottom right-hand corner, down to a temperature of about 10 to 20 millikelvin, which is colder than outer space for the most part. Um, and you can see all of this is just to get the device cold enough. And in that picture in the upper right-hand corner, you can see the cables that send the microwave pulses, which perform the quantum operations on the chip. Um, these are, um, you need to get at this cold for the, the quantum chip to function properly. Um, and when you zoom in to these quantum processors, they don't actually look that complicated compared to like a modern microprocessor. Um, these are two die photos of, quantum of two quantum processors that have open access today that anyone can use over the internet. And you can see these squares, which are just the qubits, the individual bits, the quantum bits, and resonators, which are used for um, reading data out, and resonators between the qubits, which are used for multi-qubit operations. And these are just two examples of these chips. And while all of these devices are really cool and really sophisticated and pushing our understanding of physics and how we can build these kind of devices, there are still a lot of limitations with them. The biggest one you might notice is the number of qubits. The one on the left has 14, and the one on the right has five. Uh, could you imagine if you could only use five bits on your laptop? How productive would you be if you could only use five bits? Um, that's the, the thing that most people think about when they think about the limitations with current quantum computers. Um, but there's actually bigger issues, at least from my perspective. One of them is noise. These machines are not fault tolerant. They're very sensitive to environmental factors. Part of the reason we get them so cold is because any excess heat is a source of noise in the system. Um, but there's also the issue with, um, sorry, is it? Oh, I apologize if people could not hear me before. <laughs> Do I can just hold it. This will probably be a bit better. Is that better? No? Sorry. Um, so as I was saying, the other big issue with these current devices is what's called coherence time, the amount of time you can run operations on a qubit before it loses its quantum state and you just get random data. Currently, that's around like 50 microseconds. So could you imagine if you tried to use a computer every day that you could only have five bits and only run operations for 50 microseconds before you lose your data? Um, that's not <laughs> the most practical device. So even though these devices have all of these current limitations, why am I standing here talking about quantum computing today? And to explain that, I thought it would be helpful to go over a brief history of quantum computing. I borrowed this slide from a colleague, so I don't pretend to understand the significance from each individual point on the timeline, but it's very useful for demonstrating the overall trend in the history. So you can see on this timeline the um, 
the theoretical underpinnings of quantum mechanics started in the 30s. And then in the 1970s, people started realizing you could use these quant this, print, uh, this theory of quantum mechanics to perform computation and store information. And it was a theoretical field into the 80s where people were having conferences on it, developing algorithms using this theoretical method of computation. And into the 90s, you have some very famous algorithms being developed like Shor's algorithm, which is the one that everyone is worried about from a security perspective. Um, and into the 90s, you started having practical lab experiments where people were building small numbers of qubit quantum computers in labs and experimenting with them by hand. And it was really the domain of laboratory research because, I mean, you can see you need very fancy cooling uh, to get these things to work. Um, and it was all laboratory research up until about three years ago when IBM decided to take one of their lab computers and start a project called the Quantum Experience, which is they basically took one of their lab computers, put it behind an API, and put it on the internet. And anyone could sign up and use this computer and submit jobs and run things on a quantum computer, which was never accessible. It became generally accessible to everyone in the world to start playing around with quantum computing. And that's, that's a really big deal. Um, and that's where open source started to come into play. Because with an open device that anyone could use, um, you needed a way to program it. And that's where the project I work on comes into play, which is called QuizKit. It's an SDK designed for interacting and working with uh, what are called NISC devices, in noisy intermediate scale quantum devices, um, which is basically just a term that says the current quantum computers that have all of these issues I was outlining before and into the near future while they still have the limitations with noise and smaller scale. Um, it's an Apache 2 licensed project. And it's designed to be back-end agnostic. So while it's being developed at IBM to work with the IBM computers, we're building it in a way where you can use it with any quantum computer. It just defines an abstract interface for how you would interface with a quantum computer. And you can write any back-end if you happen to work in a lab and develop your own devices. Um, but out of the box, we include support for working with IBM devices and also with simulators locally. So if you don't want to submit to an actual quantum device, you can simulate a quantum computer locally. Um, and just like a lot of open source projects, it's built up of a number of components. Um, I'm not sure how legible this is for the people in the back, but I'll, I will read it. The center circle there um, is called Terra. Um, the components in QuizKit are all named after classical elements. Someone thought they were being clever, I guess. I don't really know. Um, so Terra is the base or the earth, and it's the hardware interface to software. It provides you the tools for building quantum circuits, which are how you write programs, and um, the tools to submit those jobs to actual devices or simulators and deal with results. It's the base layer and what we'll actually be talking about for the, most of this presentation. Um, then there is the air component, which is the simulator. It just is a high performance um, simulator, which is used for simulating quantum devices so you don't have to wait uh, your turn to use a real one. Um, then there is Aqua, which is a library for dealing with algorithms. It provides a Python library interface for running uh, quantum algorithms that do very do various things, whether they're uh, domain-specific things like quantum chemistry or machine learning, but also things like more general um, quantum algorithm, like Shor's algorithm I mentioned before, or Grover's algorithm, which are famous algorithms which were developed before quantum computers were even a thing you could use. Um, and then the last component is Ignis, which hasn't been released yet, and this just provides tools for dealing with noise and error. Um, and we won't, we, you really don't have to worry about that. Um, and as I said before, we're going to be spending most of our time using QuizKit Terra because it's the base layer. And when you start looking at quantum computer, it's, it makes sense to start at the base and work your way up, just like in any subject. Um, QuizKit Terra just provides an SDK in Python for developing quantum programs. It lets you write out a quantum circuit and then submit that to a simulator or a real device, any backend, and then deal with the results. 
And it also provides a compiler to optimize those circuits. So you define something generally, and based on the device or simulator you're running on, it will try to optimize that circuit to deal with the constraints of the, or the limitations of the back end you're using. Um, and at this point in the presentation, I really wanted to show you an example of writing a quantum program in QuizKit Terra to show you how you can use open source software today to run on a quantum computer. But I realized that quantum information theory is not something people have a lot of background in. It's a complex topic and people, it's new to a lot of people. So I thought it would be useful to go through some basics. Um, this will not be an exhaustive primer on quantum information theory. I'm just going to be covering a very tiny bit just so I can show you a real example that you can run on a real computer. Um, and to do that, the thing you start with, to start talking about, is called the qubit, which is the quantum bit. And the, way, the easiest way to think about a qubit is using this, which is called the block sphere. And you can see here in the block sphere, it's just, you know, just a sphere with a, uh, with a length of one. And the current quantum state is represented by that orange vector in this picture. And you can represent the quantum state, or you can represent the state of a qubit as any point along that sphere, on the, on the surface of the sphere. And you perform operations on the qubit and you, you're basically just moving that, that point along the surface of the sphere. Um, but, um, then, and just like a classical computer, you can also have it in the zero state and the one state, um, which just is moving it between the zero and the one. And this is equivalent to a classical computer because when you measure data from a, quant from a quantum bit, it's measured along that z-axis, which is called the basis state. So you say, okay, you perform your operations, now I want to read that value out. And you'll only ever get a zero or a one. It collapses the position to be either a zero or a one based on where it is. Um, and this measurement operation is irreversible. Once you measure the quantum bit, um, you lose the state that you had before, and it's not recoverable. And you perform these operations I was talking about where you move the, that vector along the surface with what are called quantum logic gates. And these are just basically functions that transform the, um, the position of that vector in, that, in, in this representation. Uh, the example I put here is the simplest gate to think about, which is the X gate or a NOT gate. And you can see in this example, if you start at zero, in the zero basis state, and you apply the X gate, it just rotates 180 degrees over the X axis and goes to one. And this is why it's called the quantum knot gate sometimes as well, because it just inverts your state if it's in that basis state. Um, but the other, the other thing to remember with quantum logic gates is that all of these operations are reversible. So you can go back and forth and they'll work the same way. Um, and in the specific case of the X, it's pretty easy to conceptualize because it's a self-inverse. So if you just apply an X again, when it's at one, it goes back to zero. Um, and then we've only been talking about zero and run one right now. But the thing we haven't talked about is the rest of the sphere. What happens if that vector is pointing somewhere else in the sphere? Like in this example, um, when it's in the middle. This is called superposition, and it's one of the things, one of the two things that makes quantum computers fundamentally different from classical computers. Uh, it's um, basically taking advantage of the quantum mechanical property of superposition. And it's basically, you can prepare a qubit identically and it'll still behave randomly. So in this example here, having that qubit with the vector at that plus x when you measure in that state, you have a 50-50 chance, roughly, of it being a zero or a one when you measure. Because if you remember, you measure along that z-axis, and there's no, no magnitude on the z-axis. So you measure, it's in the middle, it's going to be pulled up to zero or pulled down to one. It's, it's completely random. You don't have a way of knowing. Um, and this randomness is inherent to nature. It's not 
not a limitation with our equipment. It's a fundamental property of nature. And superposition is one of the things you use to build quantum algorithms that are more efficient than a classical computer algorithm. And the quantum logic gate for putting things in superposition is called the Hadamard, uh, which is represented here, which you can think about as a 180 degree rotation over the x plus z axis. So you go from, the, if you're at the zero state, you go to the x plus one state right there. Um, and just like the x gate, it's also a self inverse. So if you start at zero, apply a Hadamard, you go to that x, and if you apply a Hadamard again, you go to a zero, which is a little bit different if you think about, think about it as flipping a coin, which is an example that people sometimes use. Um, and then the other thing that's just a little bit weird that'll come up later is with a Hadamard, if you're at one instead of zero, you apply it, it goes to x minus one instead of x plus one. And that's because if you apply that rotation along the same axis, it will um, self-invert back to one. And the last quantum operation I wanted to talk about is the CNOT, um, which is a two-qubit operation. It's called a controlled knot, and it's pretty simple. Um, when the top qubit in, the, in these diagrams is in the zero state, nothing happens to the target qubit, which is the bottom represented by that circle with the plus sign. But if it's one, you apply an X gate and you flip it. It's a pretty simple operation when you think about it conceptually, but it gets interesting when you have things in states of superposition. Um, And then you can put this all together to build quantum circuits, which are programs, um, basically, for running on a quantum computer. This is an example of a quantum circuit just using all of the gates I had before. And the only operation that I haven't talked about is that little gauge symbol, which is just representation of measurement. Um, and this is used to show dependency between operation and order of operations on individual qubits. So you can see here the qubit 0, 2, it starts at 0, it runs x, then h, and then it's the control for c naught, and then it's measured. And you can see this is just a way of representing how you run the operations for a quantum program. Um, and hopefully that wasn't super dense and I didn't lose everyone's attention because I know it is kind of dry stuff, but I'm trying to, I, I wanted to try to provide a, enough background to show you a actual example of something you can run on a quantum computer today that shows um, some interesting characteristics. So this is, th this example I'm going to be talking about is called the bernstein vazirani algorithm, which was published in 1993 before you, anyone had access to quantum computers really. Um, and it's pretty simple. Um, it basically says, let's say you have an oracle. This oracle has a secret bit string, so you know, one, zero, zero, one, or anything like that. Um, you can ask the oracle one question by giving it your own bit string of the same length. So if it was one, zero, zero, one, you can give it any combination of those four bits, and it will give you the dot product output of that secret with your input. So if, it was, if you gave it all zeros, you would get all zeros back. If you gave it all ones, you would get all ones back, for example. Um, and the goal with this is to figure out what that secret bit string is. Um, and when you do this with a classical computer, the best case scenario has an efficiency of ON, which is basically however long the bit string is, that's how many times you'll have to ask the oracle for, um, for an answer. So on a classical computer, let's, let's, uh, you just ask it with a one in every single position, and then you can figure out whether that one position is either a zero or a one, and you just loop over it. It's a simple for loop. It's a pretty simple algorithm um, on a classical computer. But when you run it on a quantum computer, it becomes an a single operation. You can call the oracle once, 
and it will give you the, um, the answer. And, and the way you implement the quantum oracle is with CNOTs. Um, it's pretty simple. So let's say our secret bit string in this example is 1001. You just apply a CNOT on the two bits where the, the control is the bit where it's one and you have no CNOT where it's zero. And this becomes your oracle function. And you can plug this into a bigger circuit. Um, in this case, like this. And every time you run the circuit, you'll always get the right answer with a single call to that oracle function. And this relies on something called phase kickback, which I'm not going to get into. But that's why there are these Hadamard gates and the X gate there. Um, but for time, I'm not going to get into how that works. And I think I've sufficiently bored everyone <laughs> um, with the quantum information theory background. Um, and now for the really interesting part, um, the live demo. If we can switch the, to the, uh, the live demo, I had originally planned to actually sit here and wa have everyone watch paint dry as I ran the individual operations. But for technical reasons, I have saved results and they're going to pull those up for me, um, hopefully. Um, so, we can, so we can at least go through how you would run, how you would write a program in Python to represent that quantum program and then submit that to a quantum computer and get your result back. Um, are we not able to switch the slides or switch to the live demo? Okay, here we go. Um, so to start, you have to define your registers. Um, in this case, from the example, we had a quantum register Q for the four bits of our, uh, the four qubits we're working with. We have that one temp bit. So that's two, two quantum registers. And then we have a classical register for storing our results. When we measure, we need to save that somewhere. So we say we're saving four qubit, we're saving the, the value from four qubits, so we need four classical bits to save that result to. Then we build our quantum circuit, which is basically, this is just a for loop in Python for a shortcut, but it's basically saying if our bit string right there is 1001, which is the example I've been using. We just loop over that, and if it's one, we apply a C naught, and if it's zero, we do not. And we build a quantum circuit object called Oracle, which we apply these operations to. Then we build that larger circuit, uh, which I called BV there. Uh, there we go, just hold it there, thank you. Um, which we build out the X gate on the temp bit, we apply the Hadamards, then we add our Oracle function, which is represented by that plus equals oracle. Then we apply our Hadamards again, and we measure. And we can then draw this with a draw function to just print out the circuit to make sure all the code we wrote represents the circuit that we wanted to do. And hopefully this picture matches because I copy and pasted the code for the slides. Um, but this should be the same circuit that I used in the slides before. Then we can run this on a simulator, if you scroll down a little bit, thank you. We look at our list of simulators and we pick the one we want to run. I pick the chasm simulator here because that gives me the result format I want. Um, there are other simulators for looking at other parts of a quantum computer, but we're not gonna worry about that. Um, and then we just say, let's execute the circuit. So we give this execute function our, our circuit that we just defined above and we say we want to run this on our simulator and give us the result. And then we say, okay, the execute function runs the program 1,024 times and it gives us our results. So you can see there, we ran the circuit 1,024 times and we got our answer 1001, 1,024 times. And we can also graph a histogram that shows 100% of the time we got the answer we were expecting. Then we can run this on a quantum computer. So we have to log in with our credentials, which are anyone can sign up for for free to get these credentials. And then we, um, this is an example that for technical reasons we can't show because I'm not on the internet. Um, but then we pull the device. This was just a visualization to show all the 
active quantum computers, but then we say, okay, I want to run on this five qubit quantum computer, and then let's execute this circuit 1,024 times. And we run it 1,024 times because these devices are very noisy, and as you can see here in our result. So when we run this circuit 1,024 times, we can print out the histogram of our result. And you can see there, 1001, we only got 46% of the time. The rest of the results are noise because of noise in the system. And that's why you run it 1,024 times. If you run it once, you don't have a 100% chance of getting the right answer on a current quantum computer because there's no error correction and they're very noisy devices. Um, and that's basically the end. I just ran it again on another device, which is even noisier because it's not as good of a device. Um, and you can see here, the results are even filled with more noise, and it's not super, super clear which one is the right answer, although you can see the right answer still has the highest probability, but it's only 28% of the time. Um, now, while this example is cool, and if, you know, that for, if the technical limitations weren't here, we could actually sit here watching paint dry and get the answer in real time from the actual device. Um, this is not a useful algorithm. This is just an example. Um, but it's, it's useful for showing just the basics of how you use a quantum computer. People are using these devices today to research how you can use what we have today and what we'll have in the near future to solve real-world problems that we can't solve today with classical computers. The, um, the best example I know of is quantum chemistry. People are using our current quantum computers to simulate quantum chemistry interactions to develop new molecules for all sorts of different applications. And even with these limitations, these devices that we have today are more useful than a classical computer because the computation on a classical computer is exponentially difficult and it's not something we can solve with our current classical computers either. But quantum computers are showing us a path forward. Um, if we can go back to the slides. Um, oops. I just wanted to talk a bit more about the role that open source is playing in this developing field of quantum computing. Um, Open source was chosen for the, the classical reason to help foster collaboration. These devices are incredibly complicated and it's a new and developing field. So open source was being used as a tool to allow research institutes to collaborate and use these devices and look at how things are working to develop techniques for the future when they're more practical so we can have common techniques for using quantum computers. And it's also being used as an educational tool. I don't have a background in quantum information theory. I've only been working in this field for less than a year. Um, but because the software was all open source, I was able to dig in, learn how the pieces are working, learn about the theory from just looking at the code and working with it because it's open. And that's how I was able to start working in this area. Um, the other interesting thing is that really excites me is that it's because we have all of this history with the development of classical computers and the development of software for classical computers to build off of. There was the talk yesterday about um, the origins of proprietary software and then how free software came from that. We're starting with all of those lessons learned today already with quantum computers. You could argue that we're before day one on quantum computing because of all the limitations I was talking about before. But we already have open source SDKs and tools for programming them and libraries to use them with algorithms that, are, um, that people can use today that are all open. And we've, we're building off all of the lessons we learned from the development of classical computers. And the thing that's even more exciting to me is the tools I'm talking about are just the tip of the iceberg for what's available in open source software for quantum computing. If you just go to that link, which I just searched quantum computing on GitHub, there are hundreds of projects that say they are related to quantum computing. Some are from other companies that are developing their own quantum computers and wanted to have their own toolkits for them. Others are people building off of those for applications and they're writing open source software that is using these quantum computers as limited as, as they are today. Um, and that's really exciting to me to see this growth in open source software um, while a field is so new. Um, 
So to just wrap everything up and try to bring it full circle, um, quantum computers are not being developed to replace classical computers anytime soon, if ever. They're being, they're being built to solve the problems we can't solve on classical computers. Um, but it's still very early. If the demo didn't uh, really hit at home, it's, these devices are quite limited still today. Um, but despite this, it's no longer the domain of laboratories. There are open access quantum computers from IBM, I think a couple other companies may or may not, I don't actually really know, um, where you can interact with a quantum computer today in its current form. And this is a really big deal because it means that everyone now has access to start learning and playing with this field as it's developing. Um, and because of that, open source is playing a key and vital role as we develop these new types of computers for the future. Um, so with that, I have some links for some more information, including for these slides, um, where you can get QuizKit, more information. And if anyone is interested in actually interacting with quantum computers, that quant IBM Q experience link will let you sign up and get credentials, and you can submit jobs to these quantum computers today. There's no money or anything involved. You just sign up and uh, get access. And then the last link is if people want to learn more about quantum information theory and in more depth, or learn more about quantum algorithms or about the devices, this QuizKit tutorials link is a bunch of I, um, Jupyter notebooks that wa work through QuizKit to show you all the different aspects of quantum computing um, and how you can interact with that. And um, with that, that was the end of my prepared material. I feel like I rushed through that a little bit. I apologize, but um, uh, thank you.